So, very few people, myself included, expected this great surge in support for you. Were you surprised? Well, this campaign has grown in a way that maybe none of us really expected. We had to struggle to get onto the ballot paper, and we got on the ballot paper. I thought there was something in the air when we organised a meeting in Nottingham one Sunday afternoon after the official Labour Party hustings, and it was ram-packed, standing room only, of a meeting that had been organised at 24 hours' notice. And, and what it is, it's a thirst of people looking for space, looking for democracy and looking for an alternative because we've been told there's no alternative to austerity and that our children are going to be worse off than we are and our children's children will be worse off than our children. People don't accept that and so what we're providing is an open democratic space here. So at one level it's about an election for leader of the Labour Party and that's obviously extremely important and a crucial position but it's also about how we do politics and how we do politics in general in Britain. Now, it's been described as Corbyn mania. Is it about you? No, it's not about me. It's about uh, people wanting to be able to listen to and discuss and debate an alternative idea about how we run our economy. It's also, I think, about the way we do our politics because there are many examples of personal abuse that's been hurled at all of us in our campaign and particularly at me. We've never responded to any of it. We don't do any of this personal abuse. We don't do any name calling of anybody, other politicians, anybody else. We stick to the issues that matter to people and that has an enormous resonance and it's bringing in young people who are involved um, in party political activity for the first time, but I've been mean, written off by so much of our, I suppose you'd call it political establishment, of saying they're apolitical, they're not. They're just turned off by the style of politics of um, Westminster. A lot of older people have come back who were lost by the wayside after the Iraq war uh, decision by the Labour government in 2003 and have now come back because they see a space and a relevance. Hence the Labour Party is now its biggest membership ever and together with the registered supporters is now nearly 600,000 people across the whole country. That is phenomenal in a country that's often been written off as apolitical. Your career has really been as a sort of quintessential campaigning opposition politician. There's now a very good prospect though that you'll end up in charge of quite a complicated organisation, the Labour Party. Does that daunt you? It's going to be absolutely fascinating because whoever is elected the leader, and obviously we've no idea what the result's going to be, and I don't want to make predictions, has a mandate from the members on a one-member, one-vote, or one-supporter, one-vote basis. And uh, that doesn't necessarily change the policies of the party. That is another process that has to be gone through. The first thing I'm keen to encourage, whatever the result, is a change in the policy-making process. We've become, particularly under New Labour, far too centralised, with the Leader's Office having far too much power, the Parliamentary Party in a sense following whatever the leader was saying and that became party policy. We became very remote. I want to see all these people that have come into the party and those that have remained in the party for a long time having a real say in how our policies are made, how we develop a housing strategy, a strategy for real social security in our society and how we challenge what is a brutal austerity agenda which is causing real hardship to many people in Britain. But not having run anything and approaching the prospect of running something is that exciting or scary? It's a responsibility and I'm prepared to take that responsibility on. Uh, running things is about the principles you bring to it and the authority you bring to it from the mandates that you've received. And so I'm very happy to push the ideas that we've been promoting in this campaign on economic issues, on education, on housing, social security, international issues and I think it's going to be a very exciting time in politics but the involvement of so many people is quite astonishing. I'll give you an example. One evening last week we had a phone bank session in London. 400 people came to take part in phone banking to Labour Party members and supporters encouraging them to vote. That is phenomenal. Tonight's meeting here in Chelmsford, absolutely packed out. We've just come from another meeting meeting of almost a thousand people in Colchester just down the road. That is the level of interest in an engaged form of um, sensible, civilised politics where people can understand that there is an alternative. We don't have to accept this me tooism in economic policies. Yesterday I uh, interviewed a number of supporters, actually in North Warwickshire, of, of, of yours. They're too 
The two concerns that many of them raised were they feel that you are anti-American and anti-Europe. Are they right to characterise you that way? I think that some of the media may attempt to characterise me in that way. What I would say is I'm somebody that has spent my life in the peace movement and human rights movement. Do I have criticisms of American foreign policy? Yes, many people do. Do I dislike America? Absolutely no. I've been there many times and I have many friends in the USA and indeed I'm following Bernie Sanders' campaign with great interest and uh, we're exchanging leaflets and badges and things like that. So it's great. And on um, Europe, my concern is that um, the um, process that David Cameron and others involved in is going to sign away the social chapter, sign away many of the social benefits and the sense of solidarity in Europe. And I think we as a party have got to be in there saying we want to protect the free movement of people across this continent. We want to protect the working time directive and issues like that that can do something to at least protect uh, working conditions across the whole continent. Among many working class people, people who define themselves as working class, there is a concern about immigration. What do you say to them? What I say is an immigration that people that have migrated to this country in considerable numbers since the end of the Second World War have made a fantastic contribution to our society. The levels of net immigration, now if you take out student numbers and asylum seekers, is actually not that great. The issue is the contribution they make to our society. And uh, I'm not prepared to condemn them. I'm not prepared to join in that scapegoating. I um, represent a very multicultural constituency. We're a very multicultural country, and we're the better for it, we're the stronger for it. So you and won't be going for the UKIP vote? Well, you say I'm not going for the UKIP vote. I've spoken to many people who voted UKIP in many places I've been to, and they say, OK, what you're saying resonates with me. You're saying solve the housing problem by building houses, solve the doctor's waiting room problem by employing more GPs, solve the A&E department problem by spending more on health. They resonate with that, and, they, and I say to them, don't blame these people that are working really hard paying their taxes and contributing to our society, blame a government that is um, subsidising the very wealthy and punishing the very poorest. That gets a resonance, I promise you. Final, final, final. promise it's final, because it's something that I've, yes. you know, I've spoken about before. Um, you've taken a lifelong interest in education. Ta tax status of public schools, selective schools, would you abolish both? Um, I think the tax status has to be looked at. Um, Abolition, no, but bringing them within the orbit of how they work within the local education system is important. And I also feel very strongly about bringing um, free schools and academies back within the local education authority, family of schools and family of education. All our children only have one childhood. They only have one time at school. And we've got to make sure it's good, but we've also got to make sure they grow up understanding each other and the diversity of our society. But the residual grammar schools you wouldn't abolish? Well, I would want to end the 11 plus, and therefore I would prefer them all to become comprehensives. Um, I think that comprehensive education is intrinsically good. It brings our children up understanding each other, understanding different abilities, and I think the comprehensive system has been very good for an awful lot of things in our society, and we should cherish it and value it, but particularly value this idea of a community of education. Value education for the learning it gives, not for the commodity it presents itself as. Jeremy Corbyn, many thanks. Thank you very much.